Welcome to episode 79 of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. I'm a retired agent writing crime fiction inspired by true crime FBI cases. We get to speak to Joel Wolfanger, who served nearly 30 years with the FBI. During his bureau career, he rose through a variety of positions, serving as a squad supervisor, inspector, special agent in charge, and lastly, as assistant director in charge of the FBI Academy in Quantico, Virginia. In this episode, Joel Wolfinger is interviewed about his supervision of the counterintelligence squad in Norfolk, Virginia, and the investigation of John Walker, a retired U.S. Navy chief warrant officer and communication specialist who sold secrets about American military codes to the Soviets for nearly 20 years. He also recruited his friend, brother, and son, and together they caused extensive damage to the U.S. national security. The John Walker spy ring has been described as the most damaging Soviet spy ring in history. Walker was arrested on May 20th, 1985. He pled guilty and was sentenced to life in prison. For those who want to learn more about the investigation, Joe Wolfinger and I recommend retired agent Bob Hunter's book, Spy Hunter, Inside the FBI's Investigation of the Walker Espionage Case. After retiring from the FBI, Joe Wolfinger served pro bono for 14 years as the executive director of the Major County Sheriff's Association. This is such a fascinating case, and I guess one of the reasons I'm so fascinated with it is that if I had only stayed in the Norfolk Division for one more year, I might have played a role in the surveillance of John Walker. But I was transferred out of the Norfolk Division in July of 1984, after just a short six months term there, so I missed it. I'm not going to say a lot today because this is a long interview. I try to keep them under an hour and 30 minutes, and this one will go over a little bit. So the only thing I have to say is thank you to those of you who have picked up a copy of my FBI crime thriller, Pay to Play, about a female FBI agent investigating corruption in the Philadelphia strip club industry. When you pick up a copy of Pay to Play, you are supporting this podcast and helping to defray the cost so that I can continue to produce ad-free content on a weekly basis. So for those of you who have read and reviewed Pay to Play, thank you. Now here's the show. I am excited to introduce my guest, Joe Wolfinger. Hey, Joe, how are you? Hi, Jerry. I'm good. How about you? I am excellent. You know, this is so fun for me because you were my very first FBI supervisor. You worked on my squad for uh, a reasonable time and then moved off to uh, one of the criminal squads. Isn't that right? That is correct. So on your squad, you had applicant investigations. And That's so, correct. And so for a lot of brand new agents, the assignment is either to work applicant background matters so that they can get to know the city or the the, the area where they're assigned and then they can move to usually criminal matters. In my case, I went to bank robbery squad, but I was only in Norfolk for six months, but I remember you well. You were such a generous and kind supervisor, so this is so cool for me. You know, Jerry, uh, the applicant work was uh, interesting because um, we had too much work for the number of agents we put on it, but they were all new agents, and they were thrilled to be doing the work. And nobody yeah. ever complained about having too much work. And you you didn't either. All right. So in Norfolk, Virginia, you know, when you first think about Virginia, you're thinking that that is not necessarily an area where you need to be worried about spies and espionage. But could you tell everyone why Norfolk, that Hampton Roads area, really is a 
potential hotbed of espionage activity. Kerry, Norfolk has the largest military concentration of any place in the country. Uh, there's a major naval base there. There are Army uh, facilities nearby. Uh, Langley Air Force Base is across the uh, Hampton Roads Harbor. Uh, it, it is chock full of military um, bases and personnel and operations. And um, while the Norfolk office was a relatively small FBI office, it was um, a big deal in the um, espionage world. And over the years, uh, the Norfolk office made a number of different uh, espionage cases, not the least of which was the John Walker case. And I take it that the John Walker uh, spy case is considered to be one of the the major espionage wins that the FBI had over the years. Jerry, it was a, a tremendously interesting case. I heard your interview recently with Juan Jackson, and he said that case in New Orleans, which was a wonderful uh, corruption case, had everything, murder, corruption, drugs, uh, all sorts of criminal activities, sex. Uh, well, uh, the Walker case uh, turned out to have uh, all those things, uh, maybe not murder, but uh, we believe he caused the death of American servicemen. And so it was a case that was an important case, and it had many, uh, many aspects to it. Well, let's get started. If you could tell us the very first time that you learned about this potential espionage matter. Let me start with a case uh, somewhere else. I didn't know about it. In May of uh, 1984, the uh, San Francisco FBI office received uh, an anonymous letter uh, politely saying, Dear Sir, I've been in, involved in espionage for several years. I've been passing top secret key lists for military communications, and I'm remorseful, and I want to be free. Uh, the writer of the letter uh, signed himself uh, only as Russ, R-U-S, and uh, went on to make it clear that he wanted to uh, give the FBI uh, information about a, uh, a significant espionage system, several people who were conducting espionage against the country, and in return, he wanted uh, immunity uh, from prosecution and uh, gave the FBI in San Francisco a uh, procedure for communicating with him in which they would take an ad in the Los Angeles Times they would say Russ, and then whatever message they wish to pass to him. I, I didn't know a thing about that. I was in Norfolk, 3,000 miles away. Uh, the uh, letter, I'm sure, got the interest of the San Francisco uh, counterintelligence uh, people. A letter like that, talking about top-secret uh, military information, uh, would be uh, uh, really the, uh, an important espionage case. Uh, San Francisco rather promptly uh, took an ad and said, hey, give us a call, and they uh, put the um, uh, a telephone number in there that I'm sure they watched uh, all the time. Uh, there was never a call, but uh, Russ sent them a second letter in, in uh, later in May, and uh, he said that... Um, he couldn't call because he couldn't trust any kind of personal uh, contact. Uh, he talked about finding an attorney and um, uh, and seemed to be kind of in a quandary about whether he was going to uh, correspond with them or talk to them. They took another ad in, in uh, June and said, hey, we understand your concerns. Uh, we've got to talk to you uh, or talk to somebody. Uh, who can represent you, and they suggested a meeting in Mexico, uh, a neutral site. Uh, he wrote them a third letter, and um, I think that third letter really was kind of interesting. Uh, he he um, really had no reason to write it. 
uh, except to tell the FBI that he pretty much come to the conclusion it would be best to give up the idea of aiding in the termination of this espionage ring, and that he thought that the guy that he wanted to report on was going to go on forever. And he said, the last thing Russ said in his letter, uh, which incidentally was received in August, was forget about me. Well, I- I'm sure that the uh, our colleagues in San Francisco um, didn't uh, forget about him, but they had done everything that you could do to uh, find the writer of this anonymous letter. The letter was, in fact, mailed in Sacramento, where there's a million and a half people. Uh, the the writer didn't have to be from Sacramento. He could have gone there and, and mailed it. They did all sorts of checks, uh, trying to find out if we or anybody else had a case like this. Um, and they were really at an impasse. When a few months later, a drunk uh, Barbara Walker... Uh, in Hyannis, Mass, uh, got on the phone one night and called the FBI and said she had a, uh, wanted to turn in uh, her husband, her former husband, ex-husband, uh, for committing espionage. Said he'd been a spy for uh, 20 years. Barbara was interviewed later uh, the next day uh, by Walter Price. Walter was an agent with the uh, criminal background. Uh, he really had never received any counterintelligence training, but um, he was the guy designated to go uh, interviewer. It's out in uh, a little bit away from Boston, so uh, he did a, a really good job. Uh, not knowing anything about espionage, he took a complete uh, statement from her and reported it exactly as she said it. Barbara said, yes, go ahead. I was going to ask you, was there any coincidence? Had this anonymous person who I I take it we're going to be able to identify later in San Francisco and Barbara discussed turning in John Walker? It was just a coincidence that at around the same time, they both were feeling this need to, to confess. To talk. That's exactly right. That's amazing. Uh, Barbara's story was uh, pretty interesting. She said her former husband, who was a retired chief uh, warrant officer who served on submarines, had been a spy for the Soviets for 20 years for the KGB. Uh, He was a private detective living in Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, It was very clear that uh, Barbara had a, a problem with alcohol. Uh, during the interview, uh, Walter noted that she drank a water glass full of straight vodka. Uh, it was in the afternoon, and uh, she was obviously vindictive and consumed with uh, uh, hatred for John, her former husband. Uh, she wanted to, to hurt him. It was, that was very clear. And she told a fantastic story that he had been a spy for uh, 20 years. He uh, had received a million dollars or more from uh, the KGB for what he did. She said that um, uh, he had pitched their daughter. They had an adult daughter named Laura who had a brief Army uh, career, uh, and he had pitched her on uh, cooperating with him and giving him classified information that he could sell to the KGB. She had rejected him, uh, Barbara said. And she also said that um, that John's husband, John's brother, excuse me, (laughs) that John's brother, Arthur, who was also a Navy uh, retired guy, had um, uh, been involved with the Russians too. And that was pretty interesting because uh, Barbara said she learned that when she was literally in bed with Arthur. Uh, she with had an Arthur. affair with, yes, with the brother. She had an affair with Arthur and, uh, she was, uh, she had discovered that John was committing espionage and she confided that in Arthur and Arthur told her 
Well, he had done it too, uh, but just uh, not as much. And don't worry about it. It's no big deal. Did she have this affair with Arthur while she was still married to John or after they got a divorce? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah, wow. No, they were, What's she was brother? still married. She had an affair with his brother while they were still married. Well, uh, no wonder she took to drinking. <laughs> <laughs> she, that's, um, that's uh, something hard to live with, you know? Yeah. You know, uh, Jerry, one of the things you do in an espionage case is you try to uh, evaluate, is this person telling you the truth? Because the problem here is uh, John was, we found out very quickly, was a retired Navy warrant officer. Uh, We confirmed that in in a hurry. So the question really is, is this a vindictive, hateful woman who would like to use the FBI as an instrument of um, uh, to hurt her husband, her former husband? Or uh, was and was he a person who um, honorably served his country? Uh, you, you, we don't really want to uh, damage somebody or uh, let people have an idea that we're investigating them for espionage if, in fact, they've been loyal and honorable and served our country. So the the question was: Do we have a woman who's telling the truth, and he was a, a spy, or do we have a vindictive wo- woman? who wishes to use us as an instrument to hurt him. So we were evaluating her story when it got to Norfolk. And as I say, Walter Price wrote a uh, a very thorough and uh, uh, account of it. Walter Price was a criminal agent who covered a lead in a counterintelligence case. And um, he he was careful and thorough and he gave us enough information, even though he wasn't a trained counterintelligence guy, that there was a, an indication that her story was truthful. And and that really came in um, kind of a crazy part of her story, uh, her, that she said that after their early years of marriage, uh, they were suffering financial difficulties, and John suddenly came into a lot of money. In, uh, she, uh, was one day looking through a, a chest of drawers and she discovered a stash of intelligence papers, espionage paraphernalia, and cash. And she confronted John and he admitted that he was spying for the KGB. Uh, now Barbara didn't react to that quite in the way many uh, wives would. Uh, Barbara said they were having trouble with their uh, relationship, and she thought that perhaps if she went with him to fill a drop, a drop being um, uh, where an exchange would would occur between John the spy and the KGB, and in uh, their drops, uh, John would put a package down that contained classified information, and they would, uh, and the, and the KGB would come by and secretly pick it up. And John would go someplace else and pick up a package that would have money in it. So Barbara thought, uh, I'll go with him and we'll do this thing together. Her thinking was that the family that, uh, it would bring them closer together. Sort of the, the family, family that the family that spies together is that what you get yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the family that spies together sticks together, and so they flew to Washington. Now all this was in Walter's uh, first uh, account of the case, and she described using pictures and instructions that the KGB had prepared for him. They drove to a location in a suburban area near a stop sign. John got out of the car and put a package on the ground. They followed instructions to another location, and John got out and retrieved the package that had a large amount of cash. And she talked about looking for and leaving signals. Now, that report got to me when I was uh, uh, the the supervisor of the counterintelligence squad in Norfolk. And um, I remember reading it really quite well. And while the first part of it, of Barbara's story seemed a little fantastic uh, that he made a million dollars from from the KGB. 
the KGB didn't pay that much. Uh, we didn't know that they had. And uh, there were earmarks in that story that would indicate that it was not true. Uh, she said that their four children, who were all then adults, knew that John Walker was involved in espionage. She said that um, Laura, their daughter, had gotten drunk one evening and told her husband, Laura's husband, about her father's espionage, and he apparently had told no one. So there were a number of people that knew that John was uh, committing espionage, and nobody had spoken up. The, the fact that all the children who were adults and the husband of one of the, his daughters uh, knew about his espionage, and nobody had ever said anything over the over the years. Um, it, it just seemed, uh, and the fact that she was uh, clearly had an alcohol problem, uh, was uh, filled with uh, hatred for him. Uh, those were indicators that the story might not be true. But the um, account of going to Washington, uh, to the Washington area, going to a rural area, filling the drop and clearing the drop and reading signals, what really struck me the first time I saw it as not uh, indicative of a story that somebody would make up. It, it wasn't the Robert Ludlum spy novel stuff. It was real. It was the kind of thing that really is involved in an espionage um, uh, situation. Barbara's motivation was twofold. First, John had recently uh, turned down Barbara's request for monthly payments. Barbara was not living well. She was literally living above a shoe factory where she worked sewing soles onto shoes. And uh, she really wasn't doing very well. She needed money, and he cut her off. She was obviously jealous of his life. John was in Norfolk uh, working as a private uh, detective, uh, living the life of Riley, uh, enjoying himself, had girlfriends and uh, cars and boats and even airplanes. And Laura, the daughter, uh, was going through a divorce. And because her husband, she had confided in her husband that her father was a spy, he had taken their son and told Laura, you can forget about getting him back, uh, because if you do, why, I'll tell the world that uh, your dad's a spy. So Barbara wanted to bring that situation to a head, and she wanted to confront John, and I'm sure very clearly she wanted to hurt him. Hmm. So she turned him in. So the the question we were faced with at the outset when we read it, and I, I, I when we read that communication that came to us from Boston, was do we have an honorable, um, honest guy who is the victim of a angry uh, uh, ex-wife that wants to hurt him, or do we have a person who engaged in espionage for 20 years and and hurt our country? Uh, I made the, maybe the best decision that was made in this case. I assigned the case to Bob Hunter, who was an agent on my squad, who had successfully handled uh, everything that we assigned Bob to do. And I think that was uh, maybe the best decision uh, made anywhere in the case. Bob was a great agent, and frankly, both of us, when we read the what came in from from Boston, we both had kind of the same attitude about it. This might be true. And um, there were plenty of skeptics uh, who did not believe that uh, this was a real case. But that's what you're faced with quite often in counterintelligence, counter-espionage investigations. We made a rule in our um, consideration of this case and how we would proceed that we would uh, do nothing that um, led uh, John Walker to suspect that he was under investigation. Because, frankly, uh, we quickly found that he was an ex-Navy warrant officer. Uh, and um, if he was a spy and knew we were investigating him, all he would have to do is stop. And, and uh, we'd never catch him. 
uh, we'd have a heck of a time building a case uh, to investigate him. So we decided we would be very careful in who we interviewed, what we uh, did uh, to not get back to John uh, that we were uh, uh, investigating him. So the first and the safest thing we could do uh, was uh, interview Laura Walker. Uh, Laura was the daughter of John and Barbara. Barbara had told us that Laura knew she was coming to the FBI, so going to her was a logical, sensible thing, and it wouldn't compromise anything that wasn't already compromised. Uh, Laura was living near Buffalo, New York, and Bob uh, went up there with uh, and met with Paul Culligan, another uh, experienced counterintelligence agent assigned. Paul was assigned to uh, to Buffalo. And uh, they interviewed uh, Laura in March. Now, we uh, received the communication from Boston in in February. And as we go, um, Jerry, I'd like to give you a, a few dates because this thing happened, this whole case happened pretty quickly. So they okay. interviewed they interviewed Laura in March. Uh, she knew her mom had talked to us. Uh, she confirmed the fact in the interview that uh, her father had tried to recruit her as a spy. Uh, she confirmed that her husband, her ex-husband, uh, from whom she was getting a divorce, had known that John was a, a, a spy. And she also confirmed the story that uh, her ex-husband had taken their son and uh, threatened to expose her father if she did anything to get him back. Paul and, and Bob then decided uh, that they would see if if Laura would uh, call her father and have a co- telephone conversation with him that we could record. I think it gives an insight into their uh, relationship, father-daughter relationship, that a daughter would be willing to call her father and uh, record it uh, for the FBI. But she did. They had a discussion. You know, uh, when you do such a call, you always uh, hope that the guy that's, uh, would say, well, yes, I remember when I tried to get you to commit espionage. Right. <laughs> <laughs> of that, course, be, that would be perfect, yeah. Yeah, of course. No conversation with a bad guy ever goes like that. Uh, they had a conversation. Laura was uh, tried to tempt him. Uh, with the idea that she was considering going back in the Army. She didn't know what she would do with herself. And um, uh, John expressed some interest in that, thought the Army was a better place than the the Navy. Um, uh, He had some racist views about the Navy that he expressed. Um, And uh, uh, at any rate, towards the end of their conversation, uh, the subject of Laura's uh, divorce and uh, child custody situation uh, came up, and John became very angry, and he said, I can't believe you told him something that we had in secret. And he said, you have given him a hammer, and you can just forget about getting your son back. Uh, there's no way you can do that. You gave him the hammer. And that's... Uh, uh, pretty much where that conversation ended. Now, we thought that was pretty good. Yeah, um, indication. Him, mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, but on the other hand, you know, the hammer could be that they were, he was dealing in drugs or that uh, he was uh, uh, gay or, you know, any number of different things that she might, uh, that he might use to embarrass or hurt, uh, hurt John. Uh, it, it didn't have to be uh, espionage. In, in later in March, we had Barbara and Laura both polygraph, uh, Barry Colvert, who was the uh, uh, polygraph uh, agent in, w, in Washington Field Office, uh, WFO, uh, polygraphed them, polygraphed both of them. Uh, Barry was, in my judgment, to just the best polygraph guy in the FBI, and and uh, he did many, many uh, 
counterintelligence, uh, espionage, polygraphs. Um, and I, I just have great confidence in his ability as a polygraph guy and as a, uh, as an interviewer. I have to interrupt to say that I have been begging him to be a part of this podcast. So hopefully he'll hear us say this, and uh, he'll be convinced to let me interview him. Jerry, Barry was, uh, I don't know, 6'3", 6'4", uh, Arkansas, from Arkansas, I think. He just kind of reaped uh, America and apple pie and uh, all the good things about uh, the FBI. And when Barry testified against you, I mean, I can't imagine that anybody, any juror anywhere ever believed that he was not telling the absolute truth. He was a great agent. He is a great agent, and uh, was a great agent when he worked, and he was a great polygraph guy. So he did the polygraph of, uh, of Barbara and Laura, and uh, Barry said they were both telling the truth. And that that's pretty good. That uh, was a very encouraging moment for us. Um, we had done uh, interviews in Norfolk with very trusted people, former agents, people that we knew we could trust. Uh, we were slowly building a, a picture of who John was. And um, uh, that moment of getting the uh, uh, polygraph on Barbara and Laura to come out with a, a positive, with a, with a, a verdict that they were telling the truth, uh, pushed us over the top and allowed us to um, you get a FISA court uh, approval for listening to John's uh, telephones at his house, uh, in his office, uh, where he worked, and um, uh, in his boat he had a telephone on his on his boat. And um, uh, gradually, a picture of John um, emerged. Uh, the question again was: the honorable person falsely accused, or was he a spy? Um, we found some indications that I thought were interesting. Uh, in the late 60s, uh, John was a petty officer, and he and his uh, family moved into a, a high-rise condo uh, called the Algonquin House in Norfolk. Uh, I grew up in Norfolk, not too terribly far from the Algonquin House, and it was one of the first, uh, I don't know, condos that was on the water. It was uh, upscale uh, and an expensive place, and it's where the mayor of Norfolk uh, lived. Um, so John Walker, a petty officer at the time, and four children and Barbara lived in the Algonquin house, which is a pretty expensive place. for yeah, uh, A little bit above the, the means or salary of a petty officer. Yeah, exactly. We found that every year in January or February, uh, John had an overseas trip to Vienna. Uh, all, overseas trip, almost all of them were to uh, Vienna. He lived in a house in Norfolk that was uh, middle class and lived, uh, he didn't live like somebody that had made a million dollars from espionage. He had a houseboat that was uh, pretty big but a little dilapidated in my judgment. He had an airplane at the airport. Uh, our pilot kind of investigated that and said he wouldn't fly it, but it was a, an airplane that would fly, and he mm -hmm. took it places. Um, he ran a business, and I, uh, Jerry, I always liked this about this case. The business was aptly named. Um, it was called Confidential Reports. He owned the business, and uh, if you're a spy... Uh, what else would you be doing but giving confidential reports? Um, <laughs> he he um, uh, approached his private eye uh, business as um, uh, kind of a TV or movie type of guy. Uh, he wanted to surround himself with women, be uh, pictured as a uh, wild and crazy guy, you know, a fun guy. Um, he was uh, almost 50. He had a girlfriend who was a uh, police officer, sworn police officer, and she was uh, 24 years old. He hired two women in his office, and we thought later in the case that 
he just he probably wasn't making all that money from the business, although he had a he did have a a, a, a decent business, but he was paying all these people. And um, we thought he probably just wanted to surround himself with women. His his business partner was a woman who um, uh, had been a topless uh, dancer at a place in Washington and was at one time married to a motorcycle gang guy, uh, a pretty, uh, uh, well, you can imagine, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, a pretty colorful woman. And uh, he did have a business. He had been, uh, he advertised himself as um, a person who could do electronic sweeps. And uh, he'd been to the Newport News shipyard, a major defense contractor in Newport News, and had conducted an electronic uh, sweep of their conference room before a meeting, presumably looking for oh, for microphones and, and uh, such things. Are leaving them? Yes, are leaving them. We we had no indication ultimately that he did leave them. Uh, he was a member of a group called the Old Crows. Uh, the Old Crows are an electronic uh, warfare uh, group of American uh, people, most of whom have uh, really pretty sensitive uh, clearances. It's a social and uh, uh, business group. He was a member of the American Society of Industrial Security, the chapter in Norfolk, and he was the guy that arranged the speakers uh, for uh, the uh, for the group. So uh, John was uh, a party guy, uh, presenting himself uh, to the world as a uh, wild and crazy uh, uh, detective. And uh, when we ultimately uh, arrested him and searched his uh, house. We found pictures that he had uh, dressed in Ku Klux Klan robes uh, with the um, uh, national grand dragon of the Ku Klux Klan. Wow. I had no idea. I hadn't heard well, that before. It was, uh, it, I mean, that's about the craziest thing that I saw in this in this case. Now, if you're a spy, and remember, as we're learning all these things, we were trying to make the judgment, was he a spy or was he uh, the victim of a vindictive wife? Well, while you don't much care for a person who's in the Klan, uh, you uh, certainly wouldn't think that the KGB would want their spies to be raising that sort of uh, notoriety about themselves. But he had appeared, Walker had, on a local radio program, uh, posing as uh, Mr. Baxter, uh, the local Ku Klux Klan uh, recruiter. Now, you know, we, my squad also investigated the Klan and uh, domestic uh, terrorist groups. We had no chapter of the Ku Klux Klan in Tidewater, Virginia, in the territory that we covered, which is, uh, you know, it was pretty, uh, we had a million and a half people down there. And uh, there was no Ku Klux Klan in, in Tidewater. Of that, I'm confident. I think John Walker just wanted to be the center of attention, and that he did this Klan thing. He was he was very clearly a racist. You could tell that from his conversations. But I, I don't think he was any dedicated Klan guy. I think it just he just did it because it gave him uh, something to do and to be the center of attention. Uh, mm. Which, which I thought was a pretty interesting thing. I, I'll, if you like, Jerry, I'll send you a picture of uh, Walker and the Grand Dragon. <laughs> oh, absolutely, absolutely. I, I think I think listeners would love to see that. Well, it's a, it, it's crazy. It's just it was a it uh, it was just a crazy uh, part of the case. So anyway, uh, he was leading the life of the wild and crazy guy. Uh, we began to find out, uh, you know, you listen on the counterintelligence, uh, FISA-approved uh, um, wiretap, you, you start hearing things about a person that gives you some sense of who they are. And I, I think this is interesting. Uh, John Walker was a um, hardworking guy. He was um, he went to work early. 
Uh, he did the work that, uh, you know, he could get to. He uh, complained about people that didn't work as hard as he was. Um, and we have a tendency, if a person is a bad person, a spy, for example, we tend to say, well, he must be bad all across the board. I would expect that uh, throughout his life, Walker's uh, work ethic and uh, cleverness uh, carried him uh, pretty well with the, with the people that he worked for. You would have liked him as an employee if you didn't know that he was committing espionage. And I take it that's part of his ability to commit espionage that people trusted him. I always thought that uh, he was uh, the perfect spy. Uh, he was clever. Uh, he was um, hardworking. Uh, and he had absolutely, he was completely devoid of a sense of right and wrong. Uh, I remember once uh, his girlfriend called him. We heard the call, of course. And she said she had gotten him some confidential information from the police department that um, only she knew and that he couldn't disclose it before Friday. She said if they uh, learn that, that you know it, then they'll they'll know that I did it and they'll fire me. She was a probationary police officer and her highest uh, goal in life was to be a sworn police officer. Well, that conversation ended, and in 10 seconds, he picked the phone up and called the attorney that he was working for, and like a little kid, he said, guess what I know? And he revealed the information that his uh, girlfriend had given him uh, for no purpose other than to make himself uh, look clever. Uh, it would have been just as good to have told it after Friday. But he jeopardized her career uh, for himself. And I'd say that's a pretty good indication that a guy, is a, a person, is a sociopath. I thought he was the perfect spy, hardworking, clever, and uh, devoid of a sense of right and wrong. So what do you need to do to prove that he's a spy? What's your game plan at this point? Well, let me... Um, uh, I'll t let me just tell you um, uh, just a couple of things. First, we needed to find out what his military file looked like, what Arthur's looked like, and we also took a look at his uh, son's military file. We found that Michael Walker was uh, assigned to the Navy. He was an active Navy guy on board the Nimitz, but Barbara had told us none of the children were involved in this, so she wouldn't have come forward. So uh, we had uh, John and his brother Arthur's uh, personnel files. Uh, an NSA, a National Security Agency guy, came down. He looked at the uh, at Art's file. Art was a, an officer, and, and I thought really the higher threat. And uh, he, the, the NSA guy, looked at the file. He came out of the little office we put him in, and he said, no problem here. Uh, Navy officers don't get their hands dirty actually dealing with code material. Then he took John's file and he went in, and when he came out, uh, Jerry, he was ashy. Uh, he, he said that if this guy was a spy, then the uh, damage is catastrophic. Wow. Um, John, uh, for 20 years, had been um, handling code material uh, that um, protected the communications to the Navy ships. And I'm sure you know that uh, the Navy uh, communicates with its fleet over the air, over radio waves, and anybody can pick that up, but you can't understand it unless it, you have the code. It's all encrypted. So as far as, um, you know, you may be able to pick it up, you may be able to record it, uh, but you have to break the code, and the code is uh, hugely complex uh, that, that was really defies uh, breaking. Uh, so uh, what Walker could have given them, according to the NSA guy, was the code for Navy communications with its fleet. Uh, and, and that would have, as one 
Admiral said, war winning applic- uh, implications. Mm. Um, I, I'm not sure that it would, uh, but I later was uh, pretty sure that, um, well, we, 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 he was providing code material during the Vietnam period. And uh, the Navy was quite explicit in laying on where our bombers were going to go, where our flyers were going to go, how high they would fly, what their targets would be. And all that information could have been and was um, certain read by the KGB and could easily have been passed on to the uh, uh, the Vietnamese who were shooting uh, air- anti-aircraft at our at our flyers. I'm uh, sure that there are uh, there were widows in Virginia Beach where I was living who were widowed because of uh, Walker's uh, espionage ring. Wow. At any rate, we're still trying to figure out did John do that? Uh, was he a spy, or was he? Uh, and it looked increasingly to us uh, like he was. We also found out that Arthur was. Uh, uh, working for a defense contractor and had a clearance and had access to information. So uh, we're in April, uh, two months after we got the case from Boston, and we had a big meeting in Norfolk. And uh, we invited down Jack Lowe, who was a squad supervisor in Washington field office, and Jim Kaluch, who was the case agent in Washington, and uh, Dave Zay. Zadie later became the assistant director in charge of the counterintelligence program. But uh, Zadie was a headquarters supervisor at the time, and I had put the case uh, with him by calling him. I knew Zadie. We were friends, and I knew he was a vigorous, hardworking guy. So um, I actually placed the case with uh, Zadie by calling him uh, before we sent anything up to headquarters. So we had a meeting there in Norfolk and uh, talked about the case and what we would do. And we made plans that uh, if he went uh, on the move one uh, anytime, we would follow him. It, it, logically, if he was going to have a espionage uh, a drop, uh, he would go to Washington. Uh, the, there was a Soviet embassy there. Uh, uh, a number of KGB uh, people posing as diplomats carried out all sorts of espionage activities around Washington. It, it was a place where, logically, Walker would be handled. So we made a plan with um, with Jack and Jim Kaluch, and um, uh, that it would involve using the uh, uh, special surveillance group, uh, airplanes, Jack's squad, my squad, and and so forth. When um, uh, and and again, we decided that we would not uh, we would not do anything that um, uh, revealed that we were investigating. And so uh, back in these days, we didn't have uh, pagers or beepers that you could put on a car that were as discreet, I'm sure, as the ones they must have today. And uh, I remember Washington Field Office uh, wanted us to put a page, uh, a beeper on on Walker's car, uh, like a tracking so it, device kind of thing. Yeah, a tracking device. And uh, uh, Bob and I did not want to do that. Uh, it, Walker, you know, had advertised himself as having counter surveillance technical abilities, and we thought, you know, if he does a sweep or something, if he really does have that capability. Uh, he could find a, a, a tracking device that we put on his car. Um, and again, we were sensitive to the fact that if he uh, knew we were investigating him, all he had to do was stop doing anything, and we'd we'd have um, we'd really have a difficult time proving anything. So our plan was let's catch him in the act. Um, and I, and really, to my knowledge, I, I don't know up until that time if anybody had followed a, uh, a spy to a drop site uh, successfully. I mean, uh, it's a very difficult thing to do, and particularly to do if um, if the person has some training in, 
and espionage. Um, and so at any rate, that was our uh, posture. Let me say that um, uh, along the way, and I may have left this out, that Barbara told us that there was a friend involved with uh, John. His name, she said, was Jerry Wentworth, W-E-N-T, Worth, in uh, in San Francisco. Uh, we had set a lead early to identify him, and I'm sure uh, San Francisco was working on it. Uh, as the case was developing, uh, San Francisco, we gave him a phone number, and they identified a Jerry Whitworth, W-H-I-T-W-O-R-T-H, Jerry Whitworth turns out to have been also a Navy petty, petty officer, also involved in communications, and a friend of, of John Walker's. So that's the status in early May uh, 1985, um, uh, actually a year, a little more than a you know, almost at the same time, uh, one year since that uh, anonymous letter was received in San Francisco. Hmm, at any rate, I see the connection. Yeah. So we had a rule for any surveillance we conducted. We'd not, you know, we would not do anything that was likely to expose that we were there. And you know how difficult that can be, Jerry, to run a surveillance and not give any indication, or particularly to somebody. Uh, Walker, again, uh, uh, claimed that he was a very clever private detective and he knew all sorts of things. Uh, I don't think he did in the end, but we had to be careful that he might. So on Thursday, May the 16th, uh, John's mother called him and advised that uh, his favorite aunt, Aunt Amelia, who'd raised John for part of his childhood, had, uh, as uh, John's mom said, cashed in her chips. Uh, now, Jerry, <laughs> my mom, if she called me and told me one of her sisters had died, she wouldn't say she cashed in her chips. Uh, it turned out that uh, John and his mom reminisced a bit about uh, Aunt Amelia. Uh, both of them, John was a trashy-talking guy, used uh, very uh, bad words. His mom did, too. Uh, they uh, talked about um, Aunt Amelia's favorite word, which began with F, she said. <laughs> and they didn't, they didn't cage it uh, or hide it at all. At any rate, towards the end of that conversation, uh, John told his mother, this is on Thursday, I, I'm going to be out of town this weekend. I'm going to Charlotte, North Carolina, and I have something to do that only I can do. Uh, hmm. which, of course, uh, prompted our interest. Uh, where is John going this weekend? So on Friday, before the weekend, it's about 5 o'clock. Uh, we're listening to the phones at Confidential Reports, and John picks the phone up um, from his desk, and I think he's going to make a call, but he stops, and his, his, the ladies there are leaving. And he must realize that he's got to cover himself. And he says, hey, uh, I'll be out of town this weekend. I'm, I'll be late. I'm going to Charlotte, and I'll be uh, late uh, getting in on Monday. And then he hangs the phone up. And, and, Jerry, it was unnerving because it was almost as if he picked the phone up so the FBI guys listening would hear it and then hung it up. Did you have recording devices in the office? No, we had... So the uh, we only were, way that you could have heard that is if he had picked the phone up and you could hear it from the wiretap. Exactly. Exactly. Wow. Wow. Yeah, I mean, so uh, at, at any rate, um, it was a little unnerving, but we decided, okay, we're going we're gonna to cover him this weekend. So my little squad went out on uh, Saturday. We spent the day there. Uh, John lived in a typical middle-class neighborhood. You couldn't set up uh, on the house and look at the house um, because if you were there very long, the neighbors would notice, and it just wasn't uh, feasible. Uh, and so we covered the main roads leading away from the neighborhood, 
we were there all day until about four o'clock. He called his girlfriend, made a date uh, for that night, and um, and and we all went home. We were back the next day at um, um, early in the morning. Uh, we again watched the um, uh, roads leading away from John's house uh, without um, trying to cover from the neighborhood itself. At about quarter to twelve, and, and Jerry, this was not going to be John Walker's day. Uh, at about quarter to twelve, uh, we decided we would uh, all pick the little drive-in windows for a hamburger or so, and the nice squad broke away. We put the airplane up. We had an airplane, and uh, they had the responsibility for covering him, uh, you know, from the air. You can't leave a plane up for eight hours. And, and, uh, so they were just arriving there when John Walker came out of his house, got into a blue and silver Chevy Astro van. It was the very first year that Chevy had an Astro van. It was a very unique car. It was easy to see and easy to follow. And uh, they watched him drive around the block several times and, you know, try to dry clean himself for, uh, so, you know, to check to see if anybody was following him. And then he went out on Route uh, 64 and headed uh, west towards Richmond. Well, my I, thought squad, he was, I thought he was going to Charlotte, North Carolina. Well, you, when you get to Richmond, you would turn north for Washington or south for um, uh, Charlotte. Mm-hmm. And uh, John turned, uh, well, uh, we were uh, tagging along at um I, I pulled off and across the, the Hampton Roads and to a telephone booth. Back in those days, uh, we had we had a cell phone. I don't know why I didn't use it actually, <laughs> but <laughs> but I needed a uh, I needed to make a landline call to Jack uh, Lowe, and I remember getting it. It was a Sunday afternoon, and uh, Jack said, "Well, we don't know which way he's going to go." And I said, yeah, but if he's in Richmond, he's about an hour away from Washington, maybe an hour and a half, and you got 85 people to get out. And Jack said, well, it's gonna, we're gonna ruin a lot of, um, Sunday afternoons. And, and, uh, we did, of course. Jack called everybody out, uh, to get them in, in position. Uh, at Richmond, I was uh, driving to catch up with the surveillance, um, uh, and, uh, uh, I heard uh, John turn north. Well, now, there was no reason to lie to people about going to Charlotte and uh, actually head up towards Washington unless he was going to be operational and, and do something uh, uh, with espionage. So, uh, I mean, the blood began to move quickly. Uh, I had a... Um, I smoked cigars back in those days, and I think I lit my first cigar for the day and I smoked about eight of them in the next 24 hours. Um, probably had to dump all my clothes uh, the next day. <laughs> but at, at any rate, Walker went around, uh, went up uh, 95 to the Beltway, around the Beltway to Maryland, and about 4.30, he uh, pulled under some trees in a rural area and uh, uh, was seen getting out of his car. Uh, by then, Bob and I were in the uh, uh, command post in the Washington field office, and we pulled the surveillance back. Again, we were we didn't want him to know that we were there, and um, we pulled the planes back. Although we had a couple planes on him at that point, and um, uh, he um, uh, at four thirty, a little after that, uh, we looked for him again, and uh, he was gone. Uh, now, I have to tell you, that was a, a difficult moment. We lost this guy. We knew, or we, we were pretty sure that he was going to engage in some sort of espionage activity, and we lost him. Jerry, I'm, I'm proud of us for that. That was a good moment for us because basically what we did, uh, we had a plan. We, in those days, without a pager, we, and there was no pager on the car, I mean, no uh, 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 locator on his car. Remember, we had decided not to put that on there. 
Bob and I had a moment or two where we thought, well, maybe these Washington Field Office guys were right. We should have put one on there. But um, uh, we didn't put the tracker on there. And we sat around the conference room, felt very melancholy. But we had a plan for what we would do, and we dispersed the uh, surveillance group, the airplanes, the uh, um, agents that were on uh, Jack squad, uh, according to that plan. And at 7.30, one of the surveillance uh, folks came on and said, I can see that blue and silver Chevy Astro van. What John had done was he had gone to a uh, hotel, checked in, and uh, spent uh, three hours just kind of cooling his heels and waiting to go do what he was going to do that night. So at 7.30, we had him. We had a ton of people. We had airplanes. Uh, we had more uh, things than you can imagine. Uh, at uh, around 8, he went through an intersection and tossed a 7-Up can out of his uh, car. Uh, we stopped and picked that can up, thinking it could be a drop. It could have a, a microchip or something in it that was uh, 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 conveyed information. As it turned out, it didn't. Uh, and uh, that was probably the only mistake we were going to make that night. Uh, the can that John dropped was a signal. John was out, ready to make a drop. And when he gets to the area, according to his instructions, he uh, tossed a 7-Up can at a certain intersection. And then the KGB guy who was there to meet him would ride by that intersection. And if there was a can there, he knew that it was a, the drop was on. Well, we had the damn can. And um, as it turns out, Alexei Takachinko, a uh, diplomat in the Soviet uh, Embassy assigned to the Soviet Embassy, and a KGB officer, we knew that, uh, was in the area, uh, must, well, he rode by the intersection, there was no can, and Alexei did what you're supposed to do if you're a KGB guy, and there's no can there at the right time, you go home. So he went home. So how do you know he was there? We saw him. Uh, oh. the, 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 we had, Jerry, we had 85 people on the ground. <laughs> and they knew, uh, they knew all the KGB guys and they saw him and they got his license and they knew he was out there. And there, and frankly, there wasn't a damn thing we could do with Alexei. Um, he had, uh, immunity, diplomatic immunity. So, uh, he could commit murder and we couldn't really, uh, charge him with anything. The only thing we could do was throw him out of the country, uh, which uh, ultimately was going to happen. So at about 8.30, uh, Walker pulled under some trees in this rural section of Maryland, got out of the car, was seen putting a package down, and then he pulled off. Uh, we sent a, a team of uh, agents in to, to look for what he put down, and I'll never forget, close to 9 o'clock, uh, Bruce Bray, who was a uh, an agent assigned to WFO, came running out of the woods, and he had a big shopping bag in his arms, and he yelled into the radio, I've got it, I've got it, I can see it, it's got secret stuff in it. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and, and Jerry, at that time, you know, we didn't, uh, five minutes before, we had a pretty interesting situation. We didn't have a prosecutable case. When Bruce found uh, a grocery bag full of secret material, 125 pages of secret documents, uh, classified documents, we had a perfect espionage case. And um, uh, that uh, drop uh, package uh, had uh, John's um, uh, fingerprints all over it. It uh, uh, John Saunders, who was the fingerprint guy in Washington um, at the headquarters, uh, did uh, uh, he did huge work and found really tons of fingerprints uh, on that on that uh, material. It all the classified documents came from the Nimitz, and guess who guess who was there? That was Michael Walker, 
John's son, who was 22 years old, he was on board the Nimitz, and it was determined, of course, that he was uh, uh, providing his father with uh, uh, classified information so his father could sell it to the to the KGB. Um, uh, Michael Walker was uh, promptly uh, arrested by the Naval Investigative Service and returned to the United States and nearly turned over to us to prosecute. Where was the Nimitz at the time? The Nimitz was in the um, Mediterranean, I think. And um, I, and that's an interesting story, and I, I will say the, the Naval Investigative Service uh, guy uh, that was our contact in Norfolk, um, uh, we went to him and said we wanted Michael's... Uh, Navy personnel file. It was on board the Nimitz. And uh, he said to us, well, I could send a cable to the Nimitz, but the captain sees all the cables. And if I do that, the captain is likely to uh, take some action against Michael that would, you know, restrict his access or something, but would tip him off that there was an investigation. So we uh, asked him, don't do that. And he sent a letter the captain did not review letters when it came into the Naval Investigative Service agent afloat, and um, uh, and therefore uh, it was slow to get Michael's file, but the captain didn't see it. When uh, when it was revealed that Michael was a spy, uh, the captain went uh, crazy and uh, called the um, Naval Investigative Service agent in and told him, uh, you're nothing but the damn commissar on board this ship, and I want to know every single thing that's going on. Mm. Um, he was uh, Navy officers' careers are not to help when it's found that somebody who works for them uh, is a spy, and uh, we found it was difficult quite often to get cooperation uh, uh, in in an espionage case or in a fraud case. And I later supervised the white collar crimes, and uh, it wasn't any easier in the white collar world than dealing with these guys. I thought our naval investigative service guy was a hero uh, for that making that tough decision. It did not help his career. Uh, the uh, guy who was a naval investigative service uh, agent aboard the ship left the naval investigative service and became an FBI agent. So um, it, it was a um, a difficult moment, but at any rate, Michael Walker was arrested and charged with um, with um, uh, espionage. So we had uh, in our hands that night uh, a um, drop package that had 126, 125 pages of classified documents. It had a letter in it uh, from John, a typed letter that he wrote to his KGB handler that started uh, Dear Friend. <laughs> wow. Okay. And it, 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 um, it said, hey, I, I've got uh, material here from S. He didn't name the people that were giving him material. And it's similar to what I gave you before. The quantity's limited. 125 pages. He's apologizing for the, for the level of uh, the quantity of what he's, uh, what he's uh, uh, passing. He talked about two other uh, uh, Sources, people who were three of them, that were people that were cooperating with him. S was his son. D, he says, is a puzzle. He said, I'm, I haven't figured him out. I don't know whether he's going to continue to help us. And I've uh, enclosed in this package two letters from D. Well, the letters were very clearly from Jerry Whitworth, who was in California. Uh, Jerry talks about his wife, Brenda's uh, Efforts to get a job at NASA in Ames, California, uh, in those letters, and it was, uh, it was apparent, and his fingerprints, of course, were found on it. And he talks about uh, uh, a K, uh, initial K, and that turned out to be Arthur, his brother. Mm-hmm. And he talked about uh, F, uh, who was a half brother, uh, who we think uh, John was probably uh, assessing. So uh, we had at that point, and I remember seeing all that early uh, in uh, the morning. It was uh, Sunday when we followed him. It was early Monday morning when we had the package. 
uh, we presented the case to John Dion, uh, who was the Department of Justice uh, uh, prosecutor who was going to handle it or was approve it. And uh, John, uh, we got approval to make the arrest. And I, this is a small thing, I guess, Jerry, but uh, Bob and I were standing in the uh, conference room of the uh, command post, and I got on the phone and got uh, uh, Jack Lowe, and uh, he sent uh, a car in to pick Bob up because we thought it was important that Bob, uh, our case agent, really the overall case agent on this case, and uh, and uh, Jim Kaluch, the Washington Field Office guy, uh, be both present when John was arrested. That's always the nice part of a case, particularly an espionage case. John had uh, gone to pick up Takachinko's uh, drop, and there was no drop. As I said, Takachinko had gone home. Sometimes these uh, drops got goofed up, so John went back to the hotel in Poolsville, Maryland, and seemed to retire for the night. We had the place surrounded, let me tell you. <laughs> and I remember at some point calling the airplane guys and telling them, uh, go home, you can, you can break off. It was about 2 in the morning, 3 in the morning, and uh, they didn't go home. They wanted to stay there and see what happened from their vantage point. <laughs> So, Every, everybody's invested in this at this point. They're invested in the outcome. Yeah, and and um, uh, so anyway, John's in his hotel room. It's about three, and um, uh, a call is made from the desk uh, at the hotel that uh, to John, uh, one of the guys presuming uh, pretending to be the a night clerk, and says your car was your blue and silver Chevy uh, was uh, crashed into in the garage. And uh, would you please come down and talk about it? So John comes out of his room and walks to the elevator. Uh, Bob and, and uh, Hunter and uh, Jim Kaluz come around the corner. Uh, they have their guns out. We had already, always carried uh, our communications about John with armed and dangerous because he was known to carry a gun, and we thought he was a dangerous guy. Uh, I have to say that in the counterintelligence world, there are not too many subjects that you carry was armed and dangerous. But um, and, and there was uh, some uh, talk that that was maybe overblown. But at any rate, when they came around and announced FBI, uh, John turned to face them, and he had a gun in his hand. So wow. for a moment, we had a pause with Bob and Jim and probably 25 other people around the corner uh, pointing guns at, uh, at John, and uh, and they ordered him to drop it, and he did drop it, and he was arrested. I asked Bob later, oh, why didn't he shoot him? Because really, if somebody points a gun in your direction, uh, that's really what our protocol was. You're supposed to shoot him. And Bob said, well, uh, I thought he had a story to tell, and I wanted to hear that story. So um, uh, John was arrested uh, and taken away. Uh, Jack Lowe told me that as uh, John got outside, there were all these agents and surveillance group people uh, standing there, a couple planes overhead, and um, it was uh, 3.30, 4 o'clock in the morning. And John looked around and saw all those people and said something like so many people I never knew. Uh, and um, uh, he was obviously impressed. Uh, he had never known that uh, they were after him. Uh, it was a great uh, surveillance and a great uh, uh, it had a great result. Uh, Michael was brought back. Uh, John ultimately um, ultimately confessed. Uh, all we had to do was show him the rust letters. And he was, he instantly knew that Whitworth was going to try to turn him in. <laughs> so he very, uh, happily, uh, cooperated against Whitworth, uh, in California. Um, Whitworth was arrested and charged and John testified against him. John, um, made a deal for Michael. Michael got 25 years. Uh, John later told, uh, told us, that um, 
uh, espionage was his legacy to his son. He was passing the family business on to his son, which is a pretty crazy uh, uh, legacy. Very um, warped. Very warped thinking. Yeah, and I, I'll give you just one uh, other uh, thing. Um, the uh, There was a young uh, woman on my squad, Beth Andrews. Beth was uh, uh, a great first office agent. She worked on my squad, uh, actually handling counterintelligence cases. Uh, she had a couple years in, and when uh, John was arrested, I mean, it was it, it was an explosion in the case. Um, we searched his house, his car, his boat, his airplane, uh, his business. We found mountains of evidence. Uh, he he had gotten sloppy in the late years, and we found. Uh, I don't know how many, but it was three feet tall, uh, a stack of documents that he had squirreled away in his house, classified documents to sell to the KGB if he ran out from another source. And, uh, uh, I mean, it was uh, it really an amazing thing. Bob went up, uh, Hunter went to uh, Baltimore after the arrest where uh, you know, you, we arrested uh, Walker, John, in Maryland. Uh, Michael was brought to Maryland, uh, and Bob uh, worked with the prosecutors up there. Uh, my squad uh, supported the Whitworth investigation out in California, and um, and uh, we worked uh, uh, Arthur. The department was very timid about uh, prosecuting Arthur, and... Um, uh, Beverly Andrus uh, was, I thought, a very capable uh, agent. And so uh, when the interviews were done with Arthur, I matched her up with a more experienced agent. But uh, Arthur went through five interviews in which he gradually confessed. You know, at first he hardly knew his brother, and then he, well, yeah, he knew him pretty well. And, yeah, maybe he'd given him, uh, he never gave him anything, but, then, yeah, maybe he gave him something, and, and finally he confessed to espionage. And we needed, at a, at a trial, to be able to show all those, uh, that a series of interviews. And and uh, Beverly, it turned out, was the only uh, agent present for all those interviews, and she became uh, a key witness in a trial. The, the department uh, wanted to really hammer him. And they wouldn't take a plea. It actually, I thought it was pretty irresponsible. He wanted to plea. They charged him with seven life counts. He would plea, plea, plea no contest to uh, six and guilty to one, uh, which would have had the result of getting him convicted on all seven. The department did not want to take that. They wanted to have a trial and get the evidence out there and show what, he, what this group had done. So Norfolk was the first one of these cases to go to trial. And uh, we, are in the, we were in the rocket docket, if you remember, the Eastern District of Virginia. And, and um, Arthur tried to plead guilty. They wouldn't accept his guilty plea. Um, and um, Beverly testified against him, uh, did a, a wonderful job. But at the end of her um, testimony, now, I have to tell you, I was at the time in Norfolk, which is my hometown. I could see my high school off in the distance and and was quite happy uh, working there. And and um, I thought, you know, this is a great case. Everything is going rosy. And, and uh, when the defense attorney asked uh, Beverly, have you, um, uh, was there anything in your, notes that you didn't put in your 302, the interview of Arthur. And she said, yes, there was. And my heart kind of sunk. I was sitting in the back of the courtroom. And I thought, oh, God, he's, he's got something here that's I mean, that's going to come out on, you know, I put this young agent in, in this uh, situation. I should have used somebody older and more experienced. And he began to uh, raise questions about that. Right. Uh, Beverly had very cleverly uh, anticipated that. She took shorthand notes, and um, she was a, an experienced shorthand writer. And and she knew that question would come. She prepared our 
prosecutor for that. And when he got up, he said, what, well, our prosecutor said, what was in your, uh, interview notes that wasn't in your 302? And she said, just, uh, the information about Mr. Walker's extramarital affairs. <laughs> 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 the judge was, uh, uh, really kind of straight laced, uh, a great judge and a straight laced guy that for whom that was probably pretty damning. And, uh, uh, anyway, we carried the day, and Arthur was convicted. John Clad, he got two life sentences because he testified against Jerry. Uh, Michael got 25 years, and um, uh, uh, Whitworth, only in California, got 365 years. And uh, uh, John died in prison. Arthur died in prison. Well, surely Whitworth will die in prison. And Michael was released some years ago and is out um, uh, today. I don't know what's happened to Michael. Good case. Yeah, absolutely. Let me ask you one question. When Barbara Walker told everybody about this, brought this case, did she know her son was involved? No. And she uh, told us all that she wouldn't, um, uh, she would not have, uh, come forward had she known that Michael was involved. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and you know, uh, another kind of an interesting thing, Barbara was frustrated because, now this this case, incidentally, now, we learned of it in February, and uh, we rolled it up on, he was arrested on May the 20th. That's, That's fast. Not a long time. <laughs> fast. But Barbara became impatient. And she had the view that all she had to do was tell us that John was a spy and we'd just go out and arrest him. So she, well, during the investigation, uh, she came to Norfolk uh, and uh, was um, uh, eager. She wanted to confront John and tell him, well, you son of a gun, I've, I've told the world, I've told the FBI, and they're going to arrest you. Um, and, of course, if she did that, we would have uh, we would have lost this great case and um, uh, Bob uh, Hunter and uh, Beverly uh, took her out, tried to keep her from drinking, took her shopping uh, spent days with her Uh, at some point she had told uh, John that she had uh, told the FBI which was an awful uh, thing and she met him in a Burger King and um, told him that uh, uh, she was not telling the truth about that, and he accepted that. And, uh, I, you know, you think of all the things you do in an espionage investigation. Well, keeping Barbara sober for her period of her visit in Norfolk of a few days and keeping her away from John and finally having a meeting in which she told John uh, that she'd been... Not telling the truth about what she said, but she was going to do it or making some uh, silly threat uh, that he accepted. Uh, it was a was in a critical part of the case. It's the yeah. sort of thing you must do. So uh, it, it 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 turned out that he had cooperated for twenty some years, did the huge damage to our navy and our defense. Uh, was certainly responsible for the loss of American pilots in the Vietnam conflict. He was a terribly damaging, terrible person, but he was clever and hardworking, and uh, you couple that with a sociopathic uh, personality, and you got a pretty good spot. Wow. Absolutely fascinating case. Now, I know Bob Hunter wrote a book about it, called Spy Hunter Inside the FBI Investigation of the Walker Espionage Case. I don't know if it's still in print, but it looks like you can still get old copies uh, on Amazon, so I'll put a link to to Bob's book. Yeah, you know, that um, that's an interesting thing, Jerry. Uh, as we were working this case, before we solved it, before we caught John, uh, we all thought, you know, this is a... Uh, this case has some sex appeal, and if we solve it, it's going to be a big deal. And and um, there were actually five or six books written about it. Bob's is the one I think you should link to because he says just what happened. 
in his book. Um, and and um, uh, but they, they also made a CBS did a three part series on it. <laughs> and you know we were all saying before in our squad, well, when we solve this case and they make the movie, I want so and so to play my part. So I always <laughs> said, I want Clint Eastwood. And the squad said, no, no, I think Rodney Dangerfield's more appropriate. So. <laughs> so, so, you know, we had all those, uh, those stories. You know how that goes. And um, But I have to say that when it finally happened, and the, the case was on the front page of the New York Times and the uh, Washington Post for almost 30 days, because you remember, I mean, we arrested John, and then Michael was arrested, and then... Uh, Arthur was arrested, and then Whitworth was arrested, and it kept going on. Every week, there was something new, and it it it, it had humongous uh, um, uh, publicity. They, you know, these books all wrote about us, and we well, we all felt kind of foolish. In what and, way? And, well, it, it, they, we didn't feel like we were uh, depicted in the right way, and uh, I mean, I had been in the newspaper. And uh, Bob, I'm sure, had. We'd all been covered in things we did. But to have somebody write a book about you, about what you did in your case, and talk about you and describe you and all that, it was it made us feel a little silly. Uh, that's the only thing I could say. We got over it. The other thing is, when we heard the damage assessment, we, we had a real downer. Because the um, NSA guy said it was catastrophic. And it made us feel kind of guilty. We we were getting what we want. You know, we were counterintelligence people. And we were living for uh, good cases. And this was a great case, really a great case. But it was at such a loss to our country. I mean, it was such a damaging thing. We were glad in the end to be um, responsible for the bringing, bringing into justice. It was a great case. Tell us more about what you did in your career after that case. Well, well Jerry, I, I uh, was fortunate enough to get to Norfolk. I, I'd served at headquarters um, at a time when people were getting through there in three years, and I got involved in a project up there that uh, took five or six. And I, uh, they um, uh, they sent me to Norfolk, I think, to kind of say, hey, you know, we'll give you a break here. And Norfolk was my hometown. Uh, I, as I say, I could see my high school off in the distance. Uh, not many people get to small towns like that. And um, uh, as it turned out, I got to move up to the ASAC in Norfolk. Uh, the whole, it's a small office, and the management staff was retiring or transferred or stepping down. And they, you know, I was the, uh, the force that was able to stay, so I got to move up in place. And ultimately, uh, when I got transferred, I'd lived in Norfolk for 12 years. That was a wow. great thing. My, my kids all got through um, the schools, and they had to speak with the same accent that I do. And, uh, <laughs> little twain. The world. <laughs> yeah, and and. Uh, so I went off to Buffalo to be the SAC up there, and uh, that was a great assignment. And I will say that uh, uh, I had heard some grumbling. How come Wolfinger gets to be in Norfolk, his hometown, for all this time? And and um, then I went to Buffalo and spent uh, two or three years there as SAC, and I never heard uh, any more complaints. So a couple of years in Buffalo kind of writes the, the system, but I... <laughs> I loved Buffalo. Buffalo was a wonderful place, hardworking, great people, great uh, office. They accomplished a lot, and I, it was it was a great assignment too. And then I ended my career at the academy. I was the assistant director in charge of training for two or three years, and that was uh, that was great as well. I had a, I had a lot of fun. <laughs> Well, I want to give you the opportunity to have the last word. Um, what would you like to say? Well, you know, I would just say that in a case like uh, the Walker case, you know, there's no case uh, handled by a single person that's a really big deal that I've ever seen. I mean, there were just a ton of people, agents, who contributed to this case, and uh, probably six or seven 
who can say if they weren't there, the case might not have ended up in the way it did. Bob Hunter, Dave Zadie at headquarters, Walter Price, who wrote the great interview, Jack Lowe and Jim Kaluch in Washington Field Office, Beth Andrus, who was a young, new uh, agent who really did a great job, Barry Colvert, the polygraph person. Cases like this are invariably the result of uh, a lot of people contributing and doing a good job. That's my last word. And that's the end of the interview. As always, back at jerrywilliams.com, you'll find a photo of Joe Wolfinger. There's also two cool photos of that drop site where he left 125 classified documents. And of course, there's that picture Joe sent me of John Walker with the Grand Dragon of the Ku Klux Klan, and they're both all decked out in their white robes. There's also a link to case agent Bob Hunter's book, Spy Hunter, Inside the FBI Investigation of the Walker Espionage Case. I didn't mention during the interview, but I actually had a chance to speak to Bob Hunter. And although he wasn't able to do the interview, Joe did that instead. I do want to make sure I include his book in the FBI reading resource. Now, the FBI reading resource is my list of books about the FBI written by the FBI agents who have appeared on this podcast. I have crime fiction, true crime, and memoirs. To get access to my FBI reading resource, all you need to do is become a member of the FBI Retired Case File Review Reader Team. To do that, go to my website and sign up when you see the pop-up. In addition to the FBI reading resource, once a month, I will send you updates on the FBI and books, TV, and movies, and keep you up to date on the podcast and my author journey. And don't forget to check out my FBI crime thriller, Pay to Play, available at Amazon.com. This episode was sponsored by FBIRetired.com, the only online directory made available to the general public featuring retired FBI agents and analysts interested in showcasing their skills to secure business opportunities. I want to thank you for listening and hope you come back again for another episode of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. Thank you.